Hello, everybody, and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we are almost at the point I realized, and I, sh I should, so I, I kind of decided today I, I should probably just finish this up. Uh, we've reached the point where we could rebuild uh, all of our source input files uh, using entirely just the game engine, meaning you run the game and it could rebuild its entire like runtime pack information. Uh, we can do that now for both our art assets and our sound assets. The only thing we can't do it for right now is fonts. And so what I was thinking is, what we should probably do today is try to put font building into the game as well. Again, we already have the code for it. Uh, it's just in an external utility. And then we would be completely ready to just say, look, we can now just ship a directory full of un... Um, like full of source assets that are completely unprocessed. Uh, and then we can run the game and the game will just pack them all up for you uh, one time and then you can just go forever, right? And so I think that would probably be the best thing to do. This is off a little bit, there we go. Uh, I think that would be the best thing to do because then we can ship a definitive version uh, as something on the, like on the Sendal page or whatever for people who uh, pre-order the game and try to build it home, uh, we could finally produce something that's like really easy for them to get started if they haven't been following the series at all. Uh, it's just like, look, you download this directory structure and then you, you just get whatever the latest source code is, you run it and it'll build all the HHAs for you automatically. You don't have to download anything um, beyond that, right? And then you're good to go from then on. So that seems to me like a good way to go. I don't know, um, but that's my, that's my current thinking. Uh, and so I think that's how we would probably want to do it. One of the nasty things about that is we do use Win32 to build our fonts because that's where the fonts come from. Like right now we load them out of Win32. Uh, and so, you know, we have an STB font path in there too, but we tried to do things without libraries on Handmade Hero, so we were calling the operating system directly for that stuff. Uh, and so doing those fonts... This way, I don't know. It seems like a reasonable way to go. I'm not sure. But there's another thing that we could do. And so this part is something that I'm, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's the right call or not. It's hard to say. But another thing that I was thinking we could do is in order to maintain sort of more of a cross-platform feel to things, another option we could uh, consider is if we took the fonts and we actually bake them into PNGs that we then load, uh, then when we distribute the PNGs, then we would by default have the fonts working on all platforms. So in other words, you wouldn't extract fonts um, out of the OS or anywhere else when you actually run the game. You would just have PNGs that are loaded through the normal PNG path, right? Uh, and, and baked into the HHAs. So I don't really know what the right tack is to take there. It's tough to say. Uh, the reason that the, that the PNG baking path is a little bit trickier is because that path actually requires us to do um, a little bit of footwork because we would need Inside the HHT file, we would need to store all of the additional information that the font has by default. Uh, so we would need to basically have a thing in there that says, look, uh, you're going to load this PNG, but man, there's all these other pieces of information that go with it. Like here's the kerning between all the different character pairs or whatever, right? So the nice part about getting it from, you know, sort of a font building process is all of that stuff is stored in the font file directly and it becomes pretty easy to just make that work, right? Uh, but the nice part about going the PNG route is then we can just create art assets that we upload that's like, here's a bitmap that is the fonts or whatever, right? And, you know, we can adjust in the HHT file, we can say like, here's how we would adjust each individual uh, you know, kerning pair, stuff like that. And, you know, it's easy enough for us to add data to those HHT files, but I just don't know if that's, yeah. I mean, I, I really, I wish I had a better, uh, I wish I had a 
better suggestion for what the right answer is here. I don't have a, a good feeling for it. So what I'd like to do today is explore that because I want to basically figure out uh, what we should be doing here and get a path towards actually doing it. Um, if we load up Handmade Hero, so I'm just going to load it up here and I'm going to uh, go to the file formats and just take a look at the font. Like what are we actually storing in here, you know, for those currently, just so we have some idea of what's happening. So if you look in here, when we've got the main HHA uh, font structure, what you can see is that we store pretty basic information. This would be really trivial to encode in our tag files, right? Because the ascender height, the descender height, and the external letting, those are just you know trivial values that we can just put into a tag. I mean, uh, not a tag, a block in the HHT file, right? Here's the font, here's the ascender height, descender height, external letting, right? So super simple. Um, and then if you look at what el else is in there, you can see we have an n squared table that you just look up into to see how far you should advance for any character pair, right? And again, that's something we can store pretty easily. We can just have you list all the pairs and we assume that there's no, uh, that there's just like a default for anything in the table that isn't what you, uh, one you manually specify. And then any one you do specify, uh, that's, what that, that's what that pair gets, right? So similarly, the one past highest code point uh, is just something that says, look, here's how many of the Unicode characters we're actually going to represent in here. Uh, and so if somebody does want to like do some localization work on the game or something like this, uh, so that eventually we would, we would have, you know, like, let's say we want like a Japanese localized version of the game. So we need a bunch of <clears throat> uh, extra code points in there that say, here's, you know, code point this, code point that, uh, that, that tells us, you know, which, uh, which ones we have, right? Uh, and, you know, not all of them have to actually be filled, right? So we can have zeros in there for code points that we didn't store um, any, you know, any actual bitmap for, so that's fine too. Uh, and I think, well, so looking at this too, it looks like we actually compress it too. Um, so we don't even have to do that. It looks like the way this is stored is it tells you what Unicode code point goes with which bitmap in a big old list, right? And then one past highest code point just tells you, look, when you expand this out into a lookup table, this is how big the table would have to be, right? Um, so that all seems really good, right? And I think we're storing these well. I think that's just fine. We don't need to do anything else uh, fancy there. So really the question is just how do we get the data in uh, beyond just this HHA font. And like I said, it seems really easy here to just put in an HHT uh, and just, just have that work, right? So I think what we would want to do is say, okay, how are we going to get all of these bitmaps in there? You know, do we export them all as separate PNGs? Um, is that just ridiculous or is that fine? I mean, I don't know, that might be totally fine. Uh, you know, what's an extra 100 PNGs in there, I guess. And then you just load them all in at process time. You pack them into the HHA and off you go, right? Um, and that would obviously be the simplest way to go because then, like, you just, you have one per and there's really not anything else you need to do, right? <clears throat> I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, the thing that would be annoying is that if an artist actually wanted to edit these, so if an artist is making them, I mean, maybe the answer is an artist never does make them, you know? Like, an artist doesn't make fonts as PNGs. An artist, like, uses a font package or something uh, and then the font package just gets exported into PNGs and the HHT like block that specifies all of the kerning and stuff right I mean who knows 
I, I really couldn't tell you. Um, so, <sighs> I mean, I guess what I'll say is let's try that, I guess, because I don't really have a better idea and I guess, you know, maybe we could try that. And so what I'm suggesting here uh, is, you know, let's say we wanted to make this stuff work uh, the way that I sort of just described. So inside sources, maybe uh, we've got a thing that's like, you know, um, uh, like instrumentation or, you know, developer or something. Uh, and in here, you know, we would have anything that's a resource that only the developers uh, would care about, right? Um, and so in there, we would have like a fonts directory uh, and the fonts directory would just have like all of the bitmaps uh, that were being used for that purpose, right? For font purpose. Uh, and then the HHT file would just be something that, you know, in, in the tags section here, uh, we would have like a developer.hht. It would list all of the stuff that's necessary for packing up that font uh, and off we would go. That's what I'm proposing, uh, eh, right? Uh, I don't have I don't have anything more concrete to say. So let's suppose we were going to do that. And so if we looked at you know what we've got for code here, um, in the handmade code directory, we've got the well I guess it's already loaded. The, we've got the test asset builder. And the test asset builder is what we've been pulling the code out of, right? That that goes into handmade heroes asset import layer. <clears throat> and so what I'm suggesting is maybe we just take this code that we have for test asset builder and you know, we've already sort of shelved it. But maybe we just make a thing that's called like font or like HH font, right? And instead of it doing something like here where it says, hey, there's this font I want you to pack, right? Like right here, uh, you can see this thing doing like a, a font loading nonsense thing, right? Uh, and it, it like says which characters are supposed to be used and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so if we just took this, and then we bring that into a uh, routine that basically, you know, writes out these things um, as, as bitmaps in a directory and as one HHT that just has like all of the definition of the font in it. You know, is that, is that sufficient, right? Does that work for us? So that's what I'm thinking. Um, I don't have any better ideas, but I think that's just, I guess, what we should try at this point to see if we can uh, do anything reasonable. And you can see here where we're sort of um, uh, defining the two fonts that we loaded. We could try to generate the output for those two fonts. And then uh, that would be... We would expect our font utility to basically load those fonts, dump all those bitmaps in the HHT out, and then we can, you know, harvest them and, and put them into uh, the sources directories and go from there, right? So that's like the best idea I have. It's not a great idea, but I, I really don't see much in the way of other clean ways to do this or reasonable ways to do this. Uh, the only other thing I can think of that we would want to do maybe is like pack them into PNGs in some weird way or something else. I don't know. But that just adds yet more complexity to our code path that I'm not really sure that we want it. Uh, and yeah, I mean, in, in theory, I guess we could just expand the total number like... So right now we, we allow grids to be a certain size. We could allow grids to be larger. Um, so we could make, you know, the sort of the grid system probably do what we needed to do. 
uh, where, you know, the grids maybe can be up to like 64 by 64 or something like this. Uh, and then you could store like all your fonts just in one bitmap that was packed. Again, I just, I don't know. I really just don't have, um, I really just, I, I mean, I wish I had a more coherent idea about how this should work, but it, it, I really just don't. This is one of those places where, you know, there is no simple answer to how you would do fonts. And the reason for that is pretty simple. Um, it's, it's the core reason why most asset processing systems are lousy and why it's just a hard problem in general. And that's because uh, when you're dealing with a very simple art asset, like a bitmap that doesn't really have anything to do with anything, like for example, our title screen bitmap is just a lone bitmap that sits there. It's pretty easy in your code to just say, all right, we just load a bitmap and we put it on the screen, right? And there's just not a lot of complexity there, so there's not a lot of complexity in the asset path. Where the complexity comes is when assets have complex interrelations and structures inside themselves with data that depends on those structures. And fonts are a great example of that. Not only do they have the notion that there's like one sort of asset, which is a font, that itself contains many assets, which are glyph bitmaps, but there's also data that happens among and between these assets themselves. So the kerning table is a way of saying that between two of these assets, here's a value that I need the program to know, right? And so as you get into more complex interrelationships between things, that's where the complexity in asset processing comes. And it gets more and more complicated as you go. Um, you can even see like every year at the GDC, there's like asset pipeline talks. How are there still asset pipeline talks, right? It's because these are very hard problems they're problems people underestimate and they cause huge headaches for studios because you end up having huge amounts of data with huge amounts of assets and huge amounts of interrelation between these assets. And fonts are the place where we will see it the most because they're the assets that have the most structure for what we are actually doing in our game, which is a very limited version of the kind of pipeline we would have to employ if we were gonna do you know, Red Dead Redemption right um where you you know you uh talk about taking these things to the nth degree so i don't really know i'm just gonna start with the simple case and i'm gonna try my best to work out from there and make something uh reasonable uh, that's just you know i think that's the best i can do in this case so I'm just gonna try that and we'll see uh, if we can, you know, more easily, if, if we can relatively uh, straight, you know, we can do a relatively straightforward uh, load of, of these tags into something that works. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna create a new file. I'm gonna create a, like an hh font, um, which is just a, gonna be a command line utility exactly like this one. I'm literally going to copy the whole thing in here uh, and then I'm just going to clip out most of it, right? So I'm going to start by just getting rid of almost everything that there is in here uh, and then we're just going to go from there. So we know that we don't have to load sounds, so that can go. Uh, we probably don't even need read entire file because we won't be loading any files. We're asking the operating system to load them for us. Uh, I think, so I'm just gonna cut all of that out. We don't need to load BMPs. So really we're just talking about this, right? You can see us doing a create font A, um, add resource font. This is us asking the operating system to you know uh, get fonts for us, right? So this is our font code um, that does its, you know, does its little dance. Uh, we've got the font stuff all through here uh, with the DC and the glyph processing and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know what, oh, this part was for the SDB path, right? Which we're not doing. That was just one day I showed how to use that path. Uh, we don't care about that. So we can get rid of that. Um, so it's pretty much just this. Uh, we can then get rid of all this stuff because this was our sound stuff and we obviously already have that copied into our game the way that we wanted it as well. 
Uh, we don't need any of this asset type stuff or any of this stuff because again, we're not really going to have to do any of that. I'm gonna save add font asset, not because we actually need it, but because I just wanted to see you know, what we were getting for these values. We'll wanna persist the, that idea forward. So we wanna keep the, like how we were getting it um, out of the loaded font stuff there and where those were getting recorded and crap like that. So we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Uh, but otherwise we don't really need this stuff. Uh, we don't need the ability to write HHAs. Uh, that's not necessary. Uh, so really all we are looking at here is just the thing that does the font part of this. So in here, uh, we will, we will need this part. So, you know, when we do the, the font loading bit, uh, we don't need any of this. And then we're back down to, uh, just the stuff where we actually do, uh, the font style stuff. All right. Just keep that in there for now. So here's where we do the font uh, creation stuff. The hero here, we did that and the non-hero and the sounds, all of that stuff was just old code we don't care about. Um, so let's go ahead and grab that out of here. And then what we can do is say, let's just focus on this stuff now. Uh, it looks like the way this was going is, yeah, so, you know, like the right HHA part, that was this. So, you know, this part here uh, just kind of comes down in here. This part here was the initialization side of things. Um, and so, you know, that's probably this, this part will probably come down here, uh, temporarily. There we go. Uh, we're going to move that probably out to some kind of a, well, I guess we're going to call the thing ourselves probably from like the command line or something. So this add font asset here, this part um, looks like it kind of needs you to already have loaded the font. Maybe, I don't know, um, but I'm gonna put that right here for now. Uh, and then we're just gonna take a quick look here at what's happening. Uh, we've kind of got our, okay. So we don't really care about any of this. Like I don't care about freeing the font because this thing doesn't need to ever do that. Um, yeah, so we really don't care about freeing the memory or any of this stuff because we're just going to do one font and leave. Uh, and if you want to do multiple fonts, you can just call it multiple times. Uh, so I think all this is fine. Um, I don't know if there's any, let's see. Surround from malloc, blah, blah, blah. Um, that all seems fine. Finalized font kerning. Uh, I feel like that can just be done maybe in here directly, which is fine. Uh, so we get rid of that stuff. Again, just trying to make this as simple as possible. And then hopefully we can collapse a lot of this down. Uh, initialize font DC. I'm not really sure where that is happening at the moment, probably in here somewhere. Um, where is that happening? So it looks like that's just something that happens as a matter of course and only has to occur once. Um, so that I think is something we could just do inside the routine again, directly. Uh, so if I just, that can just start out that way. Uh, and then what's going on here? So this load font is just the, yeah, it's just the way we get the font, uh, out of here. So that this also is something that could be uh, done directly. So we really, I think only have one function. The function is load glyph bitmap. I think that's it. I think everything else is all just one big long glob of do this, then do that. Uh, that doesn't really need to be done more than once, right? So I think this should all be fine and we can probably weld this all together uh, and be done with it. So if I get rid of this code, 
and put in here uh, the loading code right there. Uh, then I think we're ready to make this thing, you know, uh, do its do its thing. We, we can kind of go from here. So I'm going to save this information uh, just as knowledge of what we were using for fonts, because I don't remember what it was that we did at the time, uh, so that we can actually call it with that uh, from like the command line or something and see if we can reproduce the same data that we had before, for example. Uh, but for now, what I want to do is say, look, what we know we need is we know we know we need a TTF file name. Uh, we know we need a font name, and we know we need a like a value that says how how uh, big you know how how what the point size of that font uh, should be. So we know that we need these things, and we need to get all of them. So we kind of just want to say, look, if the arg count isn't four, this thing ain't gonna work. Um, so we should just say, look, if you don't give us that, we are going to give you an error, and we're gonna tell you that the way to run this thing uh, is to say, you know, uh, TTF file name, font name, point size, right? So that will allow it to print out the usage for people who don't know what they're doing or for me when I forget what the, uh, you know, what the actual values are. And then if we assume that we actually got that, then what we're going to do is say, well, the first one was the TTF, the second one was the font, uh, and then uh, we'll ask for the point size like this or something, right? Uh, and that'll be, you know, that'll be sufficient for our purposes. Once we get those things, then what we want to do is inside this call here, uh, we're going to call the right fonts call with this information. Uh, so we would do, or, uh, you know, maybe it's called extract font. That's sort of more what we're doing here. Uh, so here's the file name, here's the font name, here's the point size. Uh, and then extract font is the new name of this thing. So if I then uh, sort of get this stuff out of the way, uh, then we've got, you know, we're sort of ready to go here. We're going to need windows uh, so we can, we can pre-say, you know, since we're extracting it here, uh, we're going to need like, you know, obviously standard io.h, but we're also going to need like windows.h, right? Because we're extracting these things from windows. So that's, you know, we got to get that from somewhere. Uh, and we'll have to include, you know, I, I guess, uh, what's it, what is it, platform or is it types, handmade types? So it looks like handmade types is what we would want to for all of our types. Um, cause I want like all of my normal stuff in here. Right. And, and, uh, we don't really know yet exactly whether we're gonna use, we probably won't be dumping bitmaps. We'll probably try to write out a PNG, uh, just because that's what our game load path is built around. So rather than add a BMP loader, which admittedly would be trivial, uh, we might as well just like dump an uncompressed PNG since you can do that. It probably wouldn't be very hard, uh, to just write one of those directly. Uh, so we would probably do that. Um, looking at uh, this code now, let's just try and make this make sense uh, for load glyph bitmap um, and we'll see what's happening there. So we need a glyph index. So we need some idea of like what glyph index it's going to be. That seems like that might actually be somewhat tricky. Um, I'm not sure if we maybe want to pass that in. Uh, so we've got this thing called global font bits that we must have allocated somewhere here. Oops, that's not what I wanted. So, uh, 
it looks like that what's happening is that gets created in the this call here, right? So uh, inside here, we're actually using this device context and we can have our font bits pointer as well. So ooh, I don't actually know where that is. Uh, where is our global font bits? There it is. So that was just a void star. So here's our font bits. Uh, we would create that here. Uh, and then we are selecting these things in there. The bitmap and the BK color, all that looks fine, right? So this sets up our Windows, you know, this sets up what we need to do for Windows. Uh, it basically looks like that, right? Um, so let's just call this like, set up our Windows rendering uh, rendering buffer, I guess. Uh, and so font bits becomes the place where these things would actually be loaded. Uh, we then are going to malloc a loaded font. I'm going to ignore that for now and we'll figure out what we want to do with that later. We have the font file name here. Uh, so we're going to, you know, we know what that is. It looks like this. Uh, this is apparently not the point size. This is the pixel height. So I guess I want to say here uh, that that's actually pixel height. That's good because I don't really care about point size. It's a dumb name anyway. Uh, so that's a little bit clearer what's happening there. So uh, let's see. If we pass in the pixel height, then this will do what we want it to do still, right? So this uh, basically, this loads the font, right? And I suppose in here, because this is a command line utility, we probably want to issue an error message if for some reason we cannot acquire the font as we expect. Now, I don't really know the best way because since this is a font mapping kind of thing, there's a lot of issues that happen here and I don't know what all of them are because I don't usually work with the Windows font system. Um, So for example, I don't know if you told it to load a font that was already loaded, I don't know what this would tell you, right? So if we said like load this Arial TTF and it's like I already have that loaded, I don't know if this would return a zero. And so I'm not sure if checking that is the right thing to do. And furthermore, this, like if this thing can't add it because it was already added, I'm assuming this would then load that existing font. So I don't think there's like, I don't know if there's any way in Windows to say, I'm trying to render this specific TTF file, load it and render it. I don't, you know, because when Windows in their infinitesimal wisdom doesn't have that uh, functionality in their API, I don't think. So I'm not sure how we want to do this. It may be the case that we just have to use create font A and assume for our purposes uh, that when we're doing this, whatever comes back from here is the thing that we'll check for error. It's not perfect, uh, but I'm guessing that's the best thing to do. So if we get back null, right? Uh, then we should stop. And so we'll just print out the TTF file name and the font name here. Um, and call it a day. So that's all I'm going to do there. When we get down to here we want to just select this font um i'm not sure what this text metric uh bit is here that that was coming from where is that other code um here 
So who actually loaded, like who set up that text metric? Oh, I see. We're actually requesting it. Um, so I should be able to have that. Uh, let me let me grab that out of here. So I should be able to actually fetch that here uh, and then be good to go. So this will select it in there. Um, this will get the metrics for it so that we're good to go. Um, the rest of this stuff now, I'm going to just say, all right, let's, you know, oops, do a min code point, max code point. Um, these can just be done this way. I like this. Uh, always good. So once we get here, one past one past max font code point to be honest i assume we selected that because that's the highest unicode code point we ever would want to look for um so i guess what i would say there is i just say i don't know that that really needs to be a pound to find um that could just be a u32 uh so i might just say this and uh and do that right um that seems reasonable to me uh and we'll just leave it th like that so glyph index from code point then becomes a uh local like so uh and we allocate however big we wanted that to be and we clear it right and again, just because we're now just doing this entirely local into one like flat, simple routine that extracts the fonts, we don't really need to store these things in any kind of external structure. We can just keep them all, um, you know, where, where they should go. Now, HHA font glyph, uh, we don't really need. And so I think we may want to just sort of, I mean, we could keep it there for now but we don't really need to call it that. So I don't know how I feel about this at the immediate moment. Um, I'm going to leave it in, like I said, at, at, at the present time, but I, you know, this probably isn't something uh, that I would keep named this way. I would probably just call it font glyph or something, right? Because we do need to remember this information, but we don't need to write it out into an HHA. We're just going to dump a text file. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, you get the idea. All right, so I think that's reasonable. Um, that all seems fine. So the glyphs would go here. Uh, that's all fine. That, that all seems fine. The max glyph count is fine. The horizontal advance is fine. All of this is fine. Oops. So that's going to be something that we want to copy what's happening here. Uh, clearing that seems fine too. All this seems reasonable. Yeah. All right. So the glyph count, as it turns out, we want to start at one. Uh, we want the the initial stuff to be cleared. It looks like then we're sort of going to start filling out the basic asset data. At the moment, again, we really don't need to uh, write any of this out this way. Um, this will all be tracked automatically. So mostly all we need to do here is remember what these are. These can, this can really be done anywhere because we can get it directly out of the test semesters if we want to. Um, but for right now, I'm just gonna say, let's, let's do it like this um, so that we can access it easily uh, as we go forward. So that's all fine. We don't care about this. We don't care about this. Uh, we don't care about that. Um, so really what we need to know here. Uh, 
so this part, I'm, I'm really not sure how we want to proceed. I guess what uh, we probably want to do is just provide some information about what kind of font extraction you are doing. So for now, we only have like American English, right? In the future, let's say you want to localize. So you want to do a character set from a single font that has a bunch of European language support as well. So maybe you've got, uh, you know, Cedilla and stuff for, you know, C with Cedilla, or you want to do an umlaut or something like this, right? So these are basically collections of code points that you want to extract. And so we kind of need something that says what those should be. We basically need an array of like, here are all the code points we expect to have. Uh, and so that's sort of a separate thing that I'm gonna pull out and figure out how to feed in here so that there's like an additional command line parameter that's like, which font set did you want? Does that make sense? And that way then later, like I said, you know, someone wants to do a Korean localized version or a Japanese localized version, or someone's trying to add support for Farsi or whatever else. There's gonna be all these extra Unicode code points that you need and you might not want, like if you're gonna be doing like a Farsi version, that may come from a font that doesn't have any, you know, Roman letters in it because the Roman letters are gonna be coming from a different font if you're using them. So you only care about this font for Farsi or you only care about this font for, you know, Mandarin. And so assuming that you have it broken down like that, we need a way for the font utility to basically take like a keyword that says, which types of glyphs are we trying to extract here? And so that over time, if we want to, we can add more of those as we choose to add like language support. So that's what I want to do here. I want to add another thing here. Um, there's going to be a lot of arguments to this thing. So there's going to be pixel height. There's going to be like care set, right? Um, And we're just gonna have to go through here and have some set of like names for these things. So we're gonna need like a thing that's, you know, something like this. Let's say. So it would have like a name, like what do you want this caraset to be called? Uh, and then it would have a function, right? So there'd be some kind of a callback here that's like, uh, what's the care set in question? So it'd be like, yeah, um, care set creator name. And the name is the function. In this case, something gets called here that we don't know what it is, but we'll fill it out later. Uh, and then we have a, you know, a type diff here where we say this is a care set creator callback, right? Uh, or function, something like that. Uh, so that's all we need. Then we can have this have, you know, whatever the function is that you call. And so when we go through here, what we can do is print out all of those. So we can make uh, a little, you know, a little thing here where we say, oops, There we go. So I don't know what this is. Uh, maybe this is just like basic English, right? So this is like a, just a, our test, like basic English uh, or, or basic test. I don't even, yeah, maybe it's just test, right? So we don't even, it, like it's got the kanji owl in there. It's not basic English. It's got some other stuff in there. So we're just, we're not even pretending that it's a real character set. It's not something that really maps to anything that you particularly need to ship. Um, I guess we'll just do static here. Although what, what do we have, what, what do we have there? Global, global variable. Uh, so we've got a care set creator here that's gonna be 
uh, all of our car sets. Um, looks like that. And uh, maybe it's just global. Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, and each of these is going to have a name and uh, a pointer, right? So I guess we'll just call this test, test. And these can then be looped over and printed out. So I can do like care set index uh, is less than array count care sets. Um, don't ask me why this isn't this way, because it should be. Um, that seems good. And then, you know, we'll just loop over these and we print out uh, what they actually were. So we would say there's um, Maybe I'm feeling really generous. Uh, and so each of these things where we've got these care sets, we would say care set index um, dot name. And I'll even throw in for you uh, because I'm just that nice a guy uh, description so that you, know, you don't have to guess what kinds of characters are in involved there. Uh, maybe it just says. Right. So this way we can have a sort of a way of doing a, a rudimentary sort of extend, extension service so that anyone who wants to like add new care sets just defines a new care set creator and will make this code in here pretty easy to do. Uh, and that way it's, you know, it's trivial to make that uh, an actual, uh, you, know, you know, you want to add a new language, you just kind of add a new care set creator and, you know, it takes 10 seconds and off you're, you're off and running. Because the code inside Handmade Hero doesn't care at all about how you address those fonts. So, you know, if you want to be creative and, hey, we're going to specialize vertical, printed, traditional Japanese, right to left reading, you know, go nuts, right? And this would let you extract, you could put in like what the character ranges are that you want and, um, you know, just go from there. And I think the code in the game would then just support it just fine. So if we do that, then what we need is in here, we need some way of actually calling one of those functions. So what I want to do is introduce a Boolean that's like, uh, you know, print usage or something. And so what I'd rather do is have this, uh, and, and maybe actually I do it the other way around now I'm thinking about it. Uh, maybe I do it like this. like that and uh, that way we could do by default print out the usage if everything goes like perfectly then great but otherwise we're going to print this out uh, and so in here what we do is we'll loop over these again uh, and I'll just grab this out and say look we're going to try and match the string so we're going to do a string comp on this to see uh, if the care sets care set index um, and maybe I'll actually pull this out like so. We'll just look and see, does this particular character set um, match the name that was given on the command line? Right? So that's that. Uh, so I'll test that. If I find one, then we're in good shape and we'll call it. Uh, and we can say that we found the care set and everyone's happy. Uh, so maybe do it this way. So I'll just remember uh, which one it is here. This should probably be called test. Actually, this should be called set, care set creator just to be explicit about what's going on there. So we'll test each of these. Uh, if we find one, then we remember which one it was. So then later what we can say is, look, did we find a care set creator? Because I don't know. Uh, also, the care set name should come in here. Oops. 
uh, as args4. And the care set name in this case uh, will be matched. When it matches, if it matches, we get that. If we see that, we'll try to extract. Otherwise, we won't. Uh, and we'll say, you know, error uh, could not match character set or, or unrecognized character set. Uh, and we'll say, look, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Right? So that will allow us to have sort of a, a easy system for just extending which character sets you can extract using this utility because the utility doesn't care and the game doesn't care. So we might as well have a good way to do that. And so really then all we need to do is call that function. So in here we would say the care set creator uh, that you talked about, we'll call it before we try to extract the font. Uh, that'll make sure that we can actually, you know, uh, and I mean, we could even just pass in the Keraset creator, to be honest. Um, I suppose that would work too, uh, but either way. So we'll do whatever we have to do here to make sure that works, and then we'll come through and extract the fonts. Uh, given whatever that character set ends up being, we'll figure out what that looks like in a second, uh, and that'll determine what this looks like, right? So uh, coming through here, uh, what do we want to do now in extract? Okay, so you can see in here, uh, let's get back to where we were at. We sort of malloc some memory for processing here. We went through and started doing our thing. Uh, this stuff we don't care about at all because uh, someone else is going to add that stuff, right? Uh, so we don't care about any of that. We don't care about this. We also don't care about that because that's actually already happening right here. No one's touching the device context, so that's just redundant. Um, in here where we get the kerning pairs out, um, that all looks fine. I don't see anything special happening there to you. It seems fine to me. Uh, we run through the kerning pairs. So, so this one pass mass font uh, code point bit there, right? Uh, we're just going to make sure that those get sort of clipped. Uh, that all looks fine. Uh, and we're filling out the horizontal advance table. So that all looks, looks totally fine. Uh, I don't see anything weird happening there. When we come through here, uh, this is just our way of writing out all of our glyphs. We're not going to do it that way. Uh, anymore, right? Because we're going to actually have to put these into a HHT tag file that we uh, dump out. The horizontal advance part of things here. Uh, so the horizontal advance slicing thing, that's just, again, not going to matter because that's something that we're going to uh, export into text. So we don't have to deal with that at all. Um, so that all seems fine. I must have missed when I was copying the code out the part where we actually try to export one of these. Uh, is it this? It's not. So how do we actually end up calling load glyph bitmap? You know what I'm saying too? Huh. So you're telling me we never call load glyph bitmap? What am I missing? Oops. Um, that seems weird. Would you not agree with that? Like, shouldn't someone be calling load glyph bitmap at some point here? Was there, was there not? Oh, <laughs> that's good. I'm in the wrong file. There we go. Um, 
Um, so if we look at what's going on here, these got added as bitmaps and we just called them with this. Uh, that's literally all we did. So that's pretty boring and like exactly what we'd expect. So there, there wasn't anything, I mean, it's good news, I guess. There isn't anything we have to do besides basically this, you know, for every font in the system there, right? We would have to do that. Uh, so I think that's it. And that data is going to be coming from the, like whatever our Keraset creator, however we specify how that dumps out, what those code points are, that's the part that we have to do there, right? Um, so we'll want to make that work in some reasonable way. Uh, let's see now. So the part, so one thing I'm a little hazy on here is we, we allocate space for the max glyph count, but like we should know how many glyphs we're doing because we should be able to just say like, this is how many glyphs there are. So I don't know why the max glyph count nonsense is happening. So I think what I would prefer is I think the, the code for care set creator should spit out, here's how many characters we expect because it knows how many it wants mapped. So I feel like max glyph count is just dumb and doesn't, need to happen at all, right? Uh, I, I, just, I just don't see the point of that. T to me, that there's, there's no point. Because uh, if we look in here at how that's actually used, right? It's just used to speculatively allocate, um, you know, it, it, it's just there for no real reason. So, so I, I, I don't, I don't see the point. So I think what I'd rather do is say, look, there's a glyph count and that's something we're actually going to be supplied with. So like, this is how many glyphs and here's the array of what their code points are. That should just be supplied. So, you know, something like this. So you basically say, here's how many glyphs there are, here's what the code points are for each individual glyph. Um, so glyph index, you know, this, right? Um, glyph index from code point has to be allocated like really wide because it's trying to map a glyph, I'm sorry, it's trying to map a code point back to a glyph. But the glyph count, which is our compacted array, that we just know. So there's no point in putting a 5,000 glyph limit on it when we can just say, here's how many we wanted and be done. So everything else in here should be able to just go from the glyph count directly. So this, right, that should be sufficient. And then all the rest of this stuff can work exactly as it was. This doesn't matter. That is good because we do need this to be, you know, uh, z zeroed out or however you want to say that. Um, but everything else here should just work off of that glyph count directly. So all this stuff seems fine. Um, again, no max glyph count necessary. The glyph count is exactly what it should be there. Uh, and so all that stuff should just work. Then we should be able to literally write this routine directly too now. Uh, where we can just say, look, here's the glyph index we wanted. We don't need to write out zero because we know that that's not an actual valid glyph index. We'll go from one to the glyph count. In here, we'll say the glyph, oops, glyph code point. Uh, we know that it's whatever the glyph index is in that array gives us what we want. This, I don't know what we're gonna do with right now, so we'll deal with that in a second. Um, but looking at what this routine actually needs to take, uh, we should be able to simplify it a little bit now, right? So the glyph index shouldn't be necessary, I don't think. In fact, why is that even being asked for?
So that's the reason it's doing that is just for the horizontal advance table. which we could probably do on the outside. So you can see what's happening there. It's taking whatever the character advance amount was there. Uh, and it's kind of like stuffing that in to the horizontal advance table. Again, that all just seems pretty easy. So I think we can probably move that actually to the outside. So the return value of this could just include that, and we could return, we could we could move this to the outside, right? Um, like all of this stuff uh, just needs that care advance. So uh, at least I think that's true. So meaning in here, there's a notion of a kerning change which comes out of here, uh, and it happens if the other glyph index is not zero, right? So it's on that first one. Then everything else takes that care advance and puts that in there. So if those two things were just something that came out of the load glyph bitmap, you know, operation, then this uh, is something we can just do right in here. You know what I'm saying? So we just need those values to kind of pop out um, from that. And, and then I mean, in fact, they can just, they don't need to be here anymore, right? Um, so I think we just need to translate this into something that stores more than just a loaded bitmap. Uh, it actually just gives us all of the glyph information that we need. And then on the outside, we can just process it that way, right? Um, the max font with max font height stuff, what are we doing there? So that's just the biggest character we can handle, right? Again, to me, that sort of seems like it should be maybe more based on the pixel height, probably. Like, you know, if you told us that the biggest pixel height was blah, we would say, I mean, you know, and the other question I have is, can we just get that from Windows? Do the text metrics tell us anything like that so we wouldn't have to guess um, or have limits where we, you know, could we, could we just ask it, what's the biggest thing that's ever gonna happen um, in terms of an actual glyph size, because you, you probably should know that, right? Is it just me? Where's the search bar? There it is. So here's that get text metrics function, um, and here's what it returns. So, you know, looking at it here, that uh, is probably what we would need to know, like, you know, for the, for the width. Um, Right, uh, and we could even like double it or something, right? We could we could put in a safety factor there too if we think this might be reported a little bit squinky. Um, we could try to pad it out as well, but that gives us something to work with, right? Uh, and then the height value, again, if we took the height value and padded it, that should also probably tell us. So I don't really know what those values will correspond to. I don't know how good they would be. What's the, what's overhang? So we may wanna include that overhang as well, um, just to be safe. So I'm gonna try basing it off these things. Um, I'm gonna say, look, let's try and get the text metrics out of this thing. Uh, and then we'll worry about the, you know, the, um, and then we'll worry about allocating everything. So if I did this, where I create the compatible DC first, um, and then we sort of, uh, do this part of the process, right? So in here, I'm gonna say, create the device context and try to load it. Um, reverse the order in which we do these things. 
Uh, so, create a compatible DC, try to load the font into it. Uh, come down into this routine here where we're ready to start doing stuff with our fonts. And this, this field here now, maybe we can get rid of these so that we don't have to like guess about what's gonna happen um, in terms of how big we would need things to be to properly support it. So to do that, I would just say, all right, you know, uh, select the font right there, get the text metrics out of it. And now we can use those to create those two values. Okay, so then in here, we'll pass those in as the sizes, and these can come directly out of the text metric now. So the text metric itself, uh, we can do, you know, TM height and uh, TM max care width. I think we want to add that overhang, but I don't know. Uh, and then we probably want a padding factor. I'm, I don't know, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna double it because I have no idea how inaccurate mm, windows might be with this. So I'm gonna just do some like ridiculous nonsense here. So since there's not a lot of penalty for us to just allocate a bigger buffer than we need, uh, I feel like it's pretty safe for us to do something ridiculous here, right? In fact, you know, whatever, right? Um, so I don't think there's any harm in doing that. We can see later if it's actually necessary and if we care. But, you know, that at least gives us some padding uh, and we can kind of move on from there. So if we actually do that, then we can... <laughs> <laughs> I like I like that when there's a thing called cheese point. Um, so as we kind of move on here, what you can see is we've got some uh, some garbage we're doing here. Uh, you can see our pre-step X. So actually, I'm right to pad this because we actually leave a bunch of room, don't we? It, it appears. Uh, so you know that's probably a good thing. Um, so you can see us sort of bounding this stuff here. So we're going to need these values when we come into the uh, program so that it knows, uh, you know, what the actual boundaries are it's supposed to be keeping itself aligned to, which shouldn't be hard. Uh, looking at the rest of this stuff, yeah, I don't, I don't see anything else too weird going on there. Um, so maybe what I'll do in our types file, uh, do we have v2us in here? I think we do. Yeah, we do. So what I might say is like maybe the way we'll do this is we'll actually say that there's a v2u called max glyph um, dimension, uh, you know, and that's going to be this nonsense here. And then these can just be uh, passed that way. And then so when they come in to, not that, when we come into here, uh, when we do loaded uh, font, star font, code point, right? Uh, then what we can do in here is say, look, let's start passing things like what's the max glyph dimension uh, that'll be passed in here. I don't know what order these things should go in, but let's say that there's that there. So now everything that was doing max font width, uh, so or and max font height like that, uh, what we could do is say, you know, max glyph dim x times max glyph dim y, right? Uh, and that seems fine. Same here. I don't know where else these are used. So yeah, that mm, looks like we're just kind of 
monkeying around here. That's the height, right? Yeah. Um. Uh oh. Whoa. That was weird. My uh, second screen here that's the capture machine just blanked. Is the stream still live? Looks like it's still live. I don't see any dropped frames reporting. Still good? All right. Um, okay. So, uh, max font width, again, it's just, just this. Um, so I think these can all just be done this way. And that should just do it. Right? So we can pass that in pretty trivially. Uh, the glyph index and the code point can both be passed in here if for some reason we need it, but I don't actually think we do. Um, so, so this is n a non-issue now. This also doesn't have to happen because that's always the case. Um, and so I think this stuff can now just run straight through. All of this is fine. There's nothing weird going on there. Uh, this device context we'll just pass in. Uh, like so. I don't know, does this stuff, so does this sex, the set text color call, I don't know that anyone ever actually sets it to anything else. So I would assume that that's also something that doesn't actually have to, yeah. So that could actually just be done here where we set the background and the text color as, as separate permanent things. They don't have to really be done here. Apparently this doesn't have to happen either. I guess we tried that at one point and didn't really need it. So it looks like we're just doing that. Uh, let's see here. So these are actually, I don't know why these are set to like these numbers. Um, I assume that this should actually be set to this and this should be set to this or rather, I assume, uh, famous last words. Maybe I just broke the entire thing. You know, I don't know. Um, but off we go. So this stuff. Uh, and that's just, we're just reading out of the font bits there. Uh, so we would need to, to have that passed in for us, but that's pretty straightforward too. Uh, so that seems fine. Uh, bitmap bytes per pixel, I'm pretty sure that's just always four. Like, do we actually support anything else besides that? I like this. <laughs> that's, that's good stuff. Uh, so bitmap bytes per pic, uh, per pixel. I, I don't I don't have any idea where where that is. So I'm just gonna let Forker to find it for me. Um, yeah. So that's just that's just always four. So I'm gonna put that in there. I don't. I don't know what we were really playing out there. It's not like that code would probably really work if we weren't doing that. Like we, we don't really support, you know, arbitrary uh, bytes per, per pixel for bitmaps or anything like that. So that's kind of a, you know, one of those things that's uh, maybe not, not really quite true. So I'm not sure why that that looks like that, um, because I mean, like even just look up at this code here. You know, we're we're just assuming that there's four bytes per pixel. So there's, you know, we we didn't really write code that's you know supposed to be flexible in that way. So I really don't know uh, what the point is of that. So if we look in here, we've got uh, the stuff where we want to actually create the bitmap in question. This that's what this is doing. You know, this is like packing these texels. So we we malloc this. Uh, as a thing that we're going to return. But again, I, we don't actually have to do that because I think what we're going to want to do is write it out right here. 
Uh, so I think what we probably want to do instead is something more like this, um, where we have like, uh, something like this. And so in here, this way we can, write this out in, into a file when we're ready uh, and otherwise not really bother anybody. So I think that's all fine. That's fine. We're gonna need these helper functions. Um, this is basically just something we're using to do our pre-multiplied alpha. That all seems fine. Uh, and then this is us computing the align percentage. So that's some pretty squinky stuff there, but you know, that's this. Just somewhere to store it. And this is out height. The TM descent is something that we would need to pass in here. So, you know, I guess we'll pass that in. Um, I don't know what bound height is. I guess that's something that we found in here, right? Like that's what we found in terms of like the total area of the thing that we looked through. Um, so we're just like flipping things around and doing whatever uh, nonsense there. This actually also, I don't know that that can ever actually be float, right? Cause it's, it's, it's gonna be a, yeah, it's gonna be a regular value. So really, you know, it's more like that. This whole thing gets converted after being computed uh, and then we can go from there. So all that stuff seems fine. This seems fine too. Um, I think that's basically it. So really all we need to do here is actually, um, you know, this has to do a to-do of write out a PNG, right? Uh, we need something that can, that can put this to disk uh, but that's really all we need to do. And then we can you know, delete the memory that we were using to house it. Uh, if we were less squinky, we could actually just um, write it out directly. And that might be a uh, more reasonable thing to do. But for now, I'm just going to use the code path as it was rather than, you know, fuss with it. So I think that's what we're looking at. Um, we don't really have a loaded bitmap per se, so what we want here, and we don't need that, um, what we want here is like a, something that we can return the result in, so like this would be like a, a glyph result or something. And so we want to return one of these and we want to return the stuff that we would actually need on the outside to like write this thing into a text file properly. Uh, you know, we could also just write it out ourselves, but that just doesn't seem necessary. So, you know, let's say we got the align percentage here uh, that needs to be stored. And we've got, uh, what was some of the other stuff here? We needed kerning change and care advance. So we want to record these and send them back to whoever's listening. So once we come in here, uh, what we want to do, in fact, I guess I don't even really need to define it there. I can put it down here uh, probably and say, all right, so the things that are happening is that, that, um, and that. So this, um, yeah, I guess maybe I do want to do it this way. 
Well, eh. now let's do it the other way. All right. So uh, this will just be actually calling a v2 now and doing its thing. And then uh, this will assign it. So up here we'll just say, and you know, I mean, we don't really have to do it that way. We could do it some other way. Uh, I think the default is always this, so I'll continue defaulting to that for now. Um, but I think that's what we want. Now I would like to start trying to build this. We won't have time today because we only got a you know maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes left to get all of this working properly, but I would like to go ahead and uh, make this actually get called. Uh, these, I don't know why these are getting built at the moment because we don't need them to be. Uh, so I think, Yeah, I think all of this is fine, except instead of test asset builder.cpp here, um, we just want to build HH font. And that'll let us uh, just build, yeah, the simple command line utility. I don't know. So I guess if you don't put subsystem windows in there, then it will just do console automatically. That's probably the rule. So we should that should produce a command line ex executable, I would think. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, so let me go ahead and go through, get rid of some of the errors here. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and, uh, well, so I don't know if we want these, do we want these to be S32s? Do we actually use negative values for them? I don't think we should. Um, but I guess if we're stepping S32s here, we would have to. Um, so let's think about that. So the min would be this and the max would be zero. I think that's how that would work. Uh, and then all of these would be U32s. Because we can't, we're never gonna be, you can't step outside the bitmap, right? I don't think. Um, so all of these should be u32 a bull, I think, but that's again, famous last words. Um, but yeah, I mean, this looks like it's written that way already. Right? Because if this, this would fetch outside uh, the, the legal area if you were fitting at negative numbers. So that's just not, you know, that's not something that was contemplated by the code anyway. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, that's that. So these we need to get from somewhere else. Um, let's see here. What's the problem? TM descent. That's true. We don't have that uh, and we need to know it. So in here we would have to pass TM descent. We're gonna have to load those in there. What is the problem here? Did not have, oh, cause we aren't in, including the math library yet. Um, that's fine. So this needs to be just device context. It would have been here too, but we're not compiling that uh, code base or code path rather. So these can these, these can't be negative, can they? I hope they can't. So I'm not sure what would happen if they were, um, but hopefully they can't be. One thing we could do here is if we don't know, we could add overhang to both because we don't know uh, whether that overhang is for vertical or horizontal. <laughs> they, they didn't specify, I don't think. Maybe they did, but I didn't see it. All right, so then we've got basically just this code to get proper uh, and then and then we're good to go. All right, 
So, you know, we're pretty close here. There's not that much to do um, to just get it working to up to the point where we're running font extraction uh, and actually pulling all the glyphs out and the information we need. We're just not actually writing them anywhere, uh, which is fine. I think that would be a good place to get to. Uh, and then next weekend, we can focus on writing them out and reading them back in uh, during asset uh, update. And then I think we're, I think that leaves us at a point where we can just do full rebuilds anytime we want. Uh, no, no weirdness. So if I were to include the math side of things, uh, I think that's what happens here. I don't remember how to get those functions. Um, yeah. So if I include the math side of things, basically we get all of the stuff up there will work now. And we're, we're really just down to this side of things. And so, you know, for each of these, we want to call the load glyph bitmap routine. So let's actually try to call that properly. So here's, here's what happened there. Um, you know, maybe we do this and we say, okay, there's the device context, the font bits. We need the code point. So that's this, right? That's the code point we're talking about. Um, the max glyph dim we already have. The TM descent uh, is again coming from those text metrics. So that's something we can just pull out here because we know that the glyph bitmap nonsense like needs to, to fuss with that uh, when it's doing its extraction. So assuming that that call is fine then we need to loop over the other glyphs that we have, which is this, uh, and fill out the horizontal advance table by looking at the glyph index we're on. Um, and for every entry in the table for our glyph, uh, we need to add this information that comes back and it needs to depend on, you know, what's, what's happening here. Why this looks like this, I don't know. Um, I guess that's saying if this font is following itself, so that's what's happening here. It's saying like, if this font is following itself, here's what you have to do. Is that right? Oh, no, I see what it's saying. It's saying the other sides advance for me, has to be adjusted by whatever the kerning change is. Ugh. This stuff is nuts. Um, I've never liked the way kerning was reported in Windows. Uh, and yeah, and I still don't. Um, so this just tells me how I need to update this. These both come out of the glyph, which should make it pretty trivial, right? It's just that. Um, and so I think that's basically it. Does font bits actually need to be a U8? Can it just be a void here? Yeah. Um, so that gets us down to almost completed. Uh, all we have to do now is we, oops, that's not good. Um, all we have to do now is actually decide how our font, like this code that says what font is happening where, um, we need that to, to now like have a more specific, like we need a definition of how that works. You can see here that we want to do a glyph count and a glyph code point. So we need like this, right? And so what we need to do here is have some way of saying, um, hey, care set creator, like you need to return to us whatever that piece of information is, right? Um, so like you need to tell us how many of these things there are, right? So maybe what we could do is we could say something like, uh, the glyph count is set here, right? So, you know, well, but that makes it harder for people to use. So maybe we won't do that. 
Maybe we'll try to make a little utility that lets you do this more easily. So let's try that first. So let's say we were going to do this. Um, this obviously is nonsense and doesn't matter. Um, so what we tried to do here is said, okay, add this character range, add these specific characters, right? So what we're kind of doing here is saying something like, because uh, like imagine this was a thing that looked like this. Or like that. So imagine we were doing something more like that. And then here we would just say, OK, uh, include uh, code point, include, or include, um, maybe we make this really easy. So we just say, OK, include you know, this, include from here to here, uh, include these um, you know something like this right so we want to be able to say like include these ranges or these punctuations or this specific character and blah 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 so if we want to do something like that then what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to first count how many there are and then we want to be able to like set a thing that says what they all would be, right? Um, I also think maybe I don't need to have any maximums in this at all because if you look at the one past max font code point that could just be passed in as the actual maximum code point that you asked for right so we don't really need to have a hard-coded maximum because whatever the like the furthest one you asked for was that's the end of it um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, let's say we have a like code point, uh, code point mask. I don't know. Um, so there's something like, okay, there's a glyph count. Um, there's a like code point for glyph or, you know, code point from glyph map. Uh, and there's then there's like a max code point or one pass last code point. So like this would let you know everything that you needed to. When you get this, you don't have to guess anymore. So you don't have to have any hard coded maximums, right? So in here we would say, all right, give us the code point mask. Um, and the code point mask will tell us all the other things that we needed to know. So instead of getting passed in a glyph count, um, and a one pass max font code point like this stuff, right? These will just get extracted out of here. So the end, I guess we also need the, what was it like uh, code point for, or glyph code point, something like that. So this would tell us everything that we needed to know, and that's what we will try to make work as far as um, as far as uh, like a convenient way to make that happen from our uh, 
uh, from our character range generators. And I think one really easy way to do this uh, is we could cheese out um, like super squinky. Uh, we could do some super squinky cheese on this where we basically said, all right, look, you pass in a mask, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and so this thing gets a mask and it just does this, right? Uh, and what we do is we say inside the include and include range, right? And include just looks like this. Or something like this maybe. Again, this is just for making it convenient so that people, you know, can just have these not be, you know, uh, they can just use them trivially. They don't have to make like arrays and pass like array counts or nonsense like this. Um, again, it's just working around C++ being a garbage language. Uh, so in here, you know, I want to do my include stuff uh, and, and we can even sort of do the super crappy version here. Uh, where we call down to this other function as well, right? Um, so I think what we would want to do is just make this work in a way that based on whether the mask is initialized or not, you either just record the maximums or you actually build the array. And so, you know, Oops. Uh, a lot of purple flashes today. Um, so if we were to proceed here, we'd just do like e index, uh, e index is less than array count e plus plus e index. So for each of these, we would just say, okay, if the mask code point from glyph is set, then we are poking into the mask. So we're going to say the code point from glyph of e, e index uh, equals, um, well, this is code point from glyph. So we actually need it to be that, right? So we're saying, all right, the, the glyph count will advance and we'll store which one we're going to store in there. If instead the code point from glyph is not set, then really all we had to do uh, was increment the glyph count. And I guess that happens either way, so we could just leave that on the outside. Um, in fact, I guess these both can happen either way. Uh, so we might just say, look, the code point is that, store it, uh, and then say if the one past max code point uh, is actually less than or equal to the code point, then you need to set it, right? So that's, we'll do both functions, which means now if we want this thing to work uh, in this nice simple way where anyone who wants to do a care set can literally just define this garbage right here uh, and have it work, then all we would have to do is call it twice. So the first time we call it, we say, um, oh, we've got a code point mask and the code point mask is nothing. Uh, so go ahead and fill that out. Now we will have a code point that has the maximums and stuff in it properly. So what we can then do is say, all right, uh, or, you know, and this could be our counter mask. So we could literally just call it and remember that. Uh, we can then say, okay, here's the actual mask that we're going to use. Please fill that out. Oops. Uh, and all we're going to do is right before then, the actual array that's in there uh, that we, you know, that, that we want to, um, to fill out, all we're going to do is we're going to malloc that array, right? So all we're doing is saying, take whatever the counter mask says the glyph count was, 
um, and go from there. Now, we don't want the person to have to include zero. So in order to make this work, we actually want to always reserve space um, like this, which is not, you know, maybe the nicest thing in the world um, to have to do, but it's fine, right? Um, so I think that's fine. And then when we actually call this, it will fill it out because now there is an actual pointer there. And so it'll know what it should actually extract, right? So I think that should be fine. Let's see if we've got this down. Um, let's see here. Uh, that is total garbage. Go. All right, so that built. Um, and so now we've got uh, our utility done, but not, you know, debugged. Uh, at least I think so. Is that not? Uh, that should have built an executable. So is our build, I guess our build directory isn't in the bin. So let's take care of that too while we're at it. Oops. Um, so if I come through here and I'm assuming the HHA is there. Yeah, so we just want one of these, right? But we want this for the font file. So we want like hhfont.bat uh, and we want that to look like this so that we can call it from anywhere. There we go. Uh, so now if I do this, uh, yeah, it should say like, hey, this is the usage. Um, and here are the caraset values that you can actually supply. Um, in theory, I can actually call this something and it will, you know, presumably roll over and die or something. Uh, but we can actually make it run. So if I wanted to, uh, we'll, and we'll like debug it and stuff uh, next time. But if we take a quick look here, let me say I pass like one of these things. Uh, I should print out to what we're like, what we're looking at here. So maybe like a, a little bit of status would be nice. Why did that, how did that compile? Oh, I must've accidentally deleted it with a errant keystroke there. Um, so w when we're doing this, I might uh, go ahead and do just a printf that says, hey, like, here's what I'm trying to extract, right? Like extracting um, font, you know, blah. Uh, and it'll say like, you know, this many glyphs, code points, right? Uh, Something like that. I don't know, this is a really crappy way to print that out. I don't really super care what it says, but I just wanted to put these in here. And then, you know, when we're done, uh, we're done. I don't know why that says true. It's supposed to say false. So yeah, in theory, you know, this will do something resembling something. Uh, we need to pass the font name there, which is what font name? Yeah. Uh, so if I call this with some actual, like one of these that we had here. Um, so if I just like pass all of that, um, yeah, that looks fine. And that should still error because it should uh, not have a care set. So if I pass it a care set, um, yeah, okay. So we got to debug it and who knows what's going on there. I mean, maybe we should do a little of that right now because we started a little bit late. So maybe I should, you know, at least 
uncrash us real quick. Uh, but other than that, we're probably uh, done for the day. So if I go into the build directory and make an actual startup for this, uh, here is the command line that, that in theory does something. Um, put those in there. Working directory doesn't really matter at the moment. Uh, so let's go ahead and save that into our build directory. Uh, I think that's in, I mean, into our debug directory uh, as hhfont dot uh, and that way we can switch between these really quickly, right? You know, what we're debugging, whether it's the font thing or whatever. Uh, so just show me, I just want this to show me where I crashed. Uh, so it looks like we're crashing inside some kind of a malloc there. Um, I'm not sure why I can't get, is there a reason I can't get source here? Is that, so I can step in just fine. I guess it just doesn't know where I am. Let me compile in debug mode. Oops. Uh, and we'll just take a look and see if it can uh, give us a better, better handle. All right. Um, okay, so let's see where we're at here. Um, what is the value of mask? Ooh, sorry, what is the value of mask here? Jeez. All right. So we're in here. That seems fine. Um, Let's take a look here at TTF file name. Oh, uh, that's just garbage. It's weird that that didn't give me an error, but oh well. Oh no, it's not, no it's not. That's actually fine. So is it this, this printf that's giving us the, the issue? Yeah. So what's the problem there? Is there something weird about what we're printing? Extracting font percent %s percent %u percent %u. So what's the font name? That seems fine. What's the glyph count? Seems fine. What's the one pass max code point? Um Hmm. So what's the, what's the issue there? We're seriously having a crash in there? What am I missing? We're hitting some kind of a breakpoint there like it doesn't like something, but I'm not sure what it is. I must just be tired. So I suppose one thing that could be happening there is if we were doing something stupid, uh, like when we actually do this initialization. Of course, the other thing I forgot is we didn't clear this. We expect this to be cleared. That, that has nothing to do with it because we're not getting to that point. Um, but... This definitely wants to happen there so that, you know, we get that nice and cleared. Um, so I'm not sure, yeah, like if we were overwriting something maybe uh, where this was concerning us, we kind of threw that in there pretty hastily. The way that this actually works when it's writing in there, it's just writing into the glyph count plus plus. Oh, that pretty much everything you need to know right there. 
I was supposed to delete that plus plus when we added this, and I didn't. Um, so that should probably solve our problem. Yeah, it does. So that was boring and stupid. Um, so I think we're good to go now. It looks like we're fine. Uh, so I think we can go ahead and, and go to Q&A. Um, so that does uh, glyph extraction and off it goes. I will say that the number of glyphs listed there doesn't really make any sense, so I feel like I must have screwed something up. Um, yes. We are not checking to make sure that we don't include glyphs that are zero. So that's actually fine. Uh, we can also, uh, mm, so we might also want to make sure we don't include code points that already exist. So we could have, I suppose, done a look up there, but I'm not really going to worry about that so much. Um, that can be someone else's problem. Uh, but I think we want this. There we go. A hundred glyphs is more of what I would have expected to see. Um, like meaning the ASCII care set plus some of those kanji, that seems good. Uh, all right, so I think we're good to go and next weekend we can just merge that in. Um, how come I can't, how come I can't make Insobot listen to me on the main Twitch channel? How come he, he'll only listen to me if I do it in the, in the Handmade Network one? So I don't know what to make of that, but. Are you going to implement the PNG writer? Uh, yeah, what, I think we probably will. We'll just do it uncompressed. Because it's really not, I shouldn't be, unless I'm forgetting something, it shouldn't be really any harder to implement a PNG writer that's uncompressed. Then it's just basically it'll be similar to a bitmap, right? If we wanted to do a compressor, then you've got a bunch of work you have to do. Um, but we don't have to do that for any particular reason. Uh, yes, the Windows API does use Hungarian notation. Um, that's why it's called Hungarian notation, right? Isn't isn't it Charles Simonyi's like being having been Hungarian? That is the reason why it is called Hungarian notation. Yeah. Uh, and he, you know, was Hungarian, and so there you go, right? Uh, Reese Cyrillic. Uh, we had a yellow four coder flash day. Do we know about that color flash already? I don't really know what's up with four coders renderer, um, but this one. Uh, I don't, I guess this version, hmm, I think this version has the green flash code in it. Um, but maybe it doesn't, I don't know. I don't know what's up with four coders rendering stuff. I don't know wh where those come from. I've never really looked at it. Um, Do 
you think you still improve a lot as a programmer as opposed to when you first started? I'd be curious to know if there are specific things you work on to keep improving. Um, so I guess what I would say is, um, I feel like there's a like very, uh, there's, I feel like there's a really l long, um, I feel like there's a massive amount of improvement I could do in terms of my programming ability, 99% of which is not possible in C++ or C in C++, C++, right? So basically, like, I feel like I probably am now about as good as I can get in this language, which is crap. Um, so that's not saying much, if that makes sense, uh, for general programming purposes, right? Um, so I feel like I could get really way further down the line towards being good at programming if I had a better language. Uh, and so, you know, I think that just involves making a language or waiting for someone to make a language that's any good. Um, but basically like so if i wanted to improve as a programmer without getting a new language i think mostly what you have to focus on because there's plenty of ways i could become a better programmer without getting a new language but they don't really involve coding they involve external knowledge so like i could learn a lot of different math things i don't know um plenty of there's always math you don't know right and so i could go learn that and that would improve my programming ability uh, in, in the areas where that math is applicable tremendously. But like improving just the actual act of day-to-day -day coding, all the things I could do right now that I'm not doing in terms of like making the code quality better, they all require a different language. That's just, and people claim that there's other better things you can do in C++, like here's this new way to program this thing. They're all, I don't agree with any of them. I think they're all just garbage ideas. Um, there are clearly way better ways we could be programming. Uh, we do not have the languages to support them. That's what I would say. Um, I think John, uh, for what it's worth, is potentially enabling us to start pushing on that stuff by having really like hardcore metaprogramming pre phases in JAI. Because if you think about like what we need to do um, language wise is we need more people to be able to do experiments with more language constructs. And the way to do that is not to make some stupid language decisions at a meeting every year like C++ does and then force everyone to use it. Like that doesn't do anything. That's a waste of everyone's time. Um, the way you need to do things to find new language constructs that actually work and produce good quality code is you need a lot of people experimenting to find what those things are, right? Um, and so I think that that's a pretty good start. And so I, I think that, that having maybe something like JAI where people can work on their own metaprogramming stuff. And when we find good ones, they can be kind of like pointed to and say, here's a language feature that seems like it really creates some really nice code uh, with not very much effort on the part of the programmer or whatever. That's more what we need. And a lot less of this, like, let's get a bunch of people who think it's actually worth their time to go to a committee meeting where everyone will argue about stuff and nothing gets done, and then we adopt some really crappy standard, which is basically how C++ evolves. I mean, I mean that's just, it's obviously doesn't work. Like you can see the past 30 years can tell you that that doesn't work. So I think there are way better ways to do it. Uh, and I'm hoping that maybe JI will open up one of those. Is it hard to write a level editor? Um, no, it's not that hard. There are more things you have to worry about. Um, but we already had to worry about some of those. Like, you know, in Handmade Hero, if you run it, um, so, you know, you're, you know, 
Uh, if you run Handmade Hero, I should I should probably do the the full uh, build here. So, you know, if you just wrote just the game engine, you could probably avoid writing this stuff. But since we actually have some of that support in here, you know, some of the harder stuff to do, like the picking and stuff, we actually already implemented. So, you know, um, some of this stuff where I can, like, select... Um, individual things by clicking on them with the mouse like that. Um, that's the sort of thing that you need to add that you wouldn't have had to add otherwise. I don't actually know if that's something that uh, is all that hard, but having to unproject the mouse and that sort of stuff is an example. But there's not a whole lot more to it than that. We showed how to do like little ad hoc UIs here. Uh, we didn't go overboard with it, so they're kind of crappy. But you know, making a better one is not a huge effort. It's just spending some time polishing these things. So, you know, I mean, really with this and this, you should be able to more or less make a level editor and handmade here without a whole lot of effort, right? We had block picking in there, but we're not doing that anymore. I think because we shunted the path that renders the blocks into a different thing that no longer calls the picking code. But I think it's not hard to add that. So you could have, I think you could have done that because it was working before. Um, Um, all right, so there's a lot of stuff in here. I'm probably not going to get to all of these. Um, what do you mean by a better language? I just mean a language that provides more uh, ability for the programmer to quickly specify what it is they intended to have the CPU do, right? Um, you know... I, it's hard to go into too much more detail than that without designing a whole language and saying like, look, here's the better language. But that's the point. Um, language design is inherently a compression problem. The output is known, right? We can sit there and go, here's the optimal assembly language code for pretty much anything. Like we know how to do that, right? We can get a bunch of expert assembly language programmers in here and we can say, this is the output that we wanted, right? If we absolutely took every little thing and did it 100% correctly. The goal of a programming language is figure out the lowest amount of text that you need to enter to get that thing to be generated, right? Uh, not only is nobody working on that problem, like nobody even frames it as that problem, which is terrible, uh, but we haven't really made any progress in that direction since C that I know of. Um, so I can't even point to a thing that we've done since C that actually gets you closer to that goal, right? Most of what I see languages do is they trade the ability to create good code, meaning like efficient CPU output. And what they do is they say, in how about you accept the code getting crappier in order for you to do less work to specify it? But I am not really that interested in that. Like, that seems like just being really defeatist when you start off with it, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I just, that's what I mean by better language. We haven't really gotten very far. Um, C++ is absolutely terrible at that. Um, you know, I, I would throw the entire thing away if I were starting. I, I would I would scrap 100% of what C++ added to C. Uh, and, you know, you'd, you'd start at C and go forward from there. 
I really like your programming style of returning a struct from a function. I have been using it a lot. Is it true that it was not possible to return a struct from a function at the early days of C? Um, I, I'm not really an expert in the early days of C, but what I can tell you is that, um, you know, if you think about what the compiler was originally sort of set up to do, uh, you could easily have imagined the initial C compilers as just saying a return value is like something that's left in a register, right? Um, I don't know if that's how it was implemented originally, but that's a pretty good guess at how it probably was. And so if that was the way that it was done originally, then you could see why structs would not really have been returnable because there's more in a struct that can be in one register. And so the entire compiler just wouldn't work. So my assumption is that at some point they expanded the notion of the binary interface, like you know the ABI to say, hey, if the return value of a function doesn't fit in a register, like here's the rules for how we will return it, right? And then that just got added and then from then on you could. So I don't really know when that happened. I don't remember anything like that. Um, but that's probably, you know, probably what happened would be my, if I had to like randomly work backwards from knowing how things typically happen in, during development, my guess would be the first compiler Z for C probably were all about register returns. And it wasn't probably till sometime later that someone said it would be nice if we could return anything we wanted. And then they made a way to do that um, using the stack, right? If you're making a game with a lot of on-screen text, what text rendering technique would you think you'd go for? Um, I mean, again, it, it, that's really not super relevant. Um, on-screen text, is not the thing that makes text interesting or not. I mean, the, or is not, I should say, whether or not there's a lot of text on screen doesn't really have anything to do with how you would render it. It's more about the nature of that text, right? Um, it's exactly the same as asking the question, you've got a lot of grass in the game, how would you render it? And you need to answer a bunch of questions before you know what the most efficient way is. Does the grass need to move around? Does it need to move in a way that uh, isn't really possible to be baked down to a procedural function? Um, do different parts of grass, like is there a level of detail? Do I zoom in and out on it, right? Um, all of that stuff is important to answer because all of those would affect if you were trying to say, look, I want to really optimize my text rendering. It's more about all of these other things and not about how much of it you have. Obviously, if you don't have very much of it, you don't have to care at all because you probably whatever you do will be fine. But if you do have a lot of it, then you have to answer a lot of other questions. Am I going to zoom all the way in until the top of a T is taking up the entire screen? Um, am I going to zoom all the way out so that there are billions and billions of words on the screen at once that are all just like a pixel wide, like, you know, like what are what are your actual requirements, and then you can start talking about what, what actually has to happen. Um, but until then, it's kind of a meaningless question because there's just tons of different ways you could in, imagine to do it. How do you visualize your logic so easily? Sometimes I'll write a complicated function; it will take me potentially hours to debug or fully understand, but that never seems to be a problem for you. Um, I guess I would say there's two sides to that. One or two answers to that. One is probably just experience is part of it. I mean, having programmed since I was seven years old, right? Like at some point you just build up neurological pathways that make it easier for you to do stuff. It's just the same as like, you know, how does somebody, you know, dribble a basketball or whatever. It's like, well, after you've done it enough times, you can just sort of do it. And that gives you a pretty good, you know, uh, leg up on someone who's only been programming five years or even 10 years, you know, Programming 30 plus years is more than that, right? Um, and that's all. Uh, so some of it's just pra that practice that just eventually, you know, you get better. The other side of it is there are conscious things I'm doing that help. I have a lot of like sort of rules that I follow. You'll notice the way I structure my routines tends to look very regular. I tend to not have a lot of return points. I tend to declare things right when I actually have a value for them. I tend to 
do my if handling as nested blocks where the else's are the errors, right? And those things are just ways that I help myself eliminate the need to remember what I did. Because if there's only one way that you tend to do something, you don't have to remember which one you did. You can just assume that you did it, right? And that, the bonus of that cannot really be overstated. When I was programming on the witness, which is a code base that does everything differently than the way I do it, I had like way more bugs per day. Because anytime I would interface with the external code, I would like make silent assumptions in my head that I didn't even know I was making about how one would do something. And those things were just not the same. It wasn't that they were worse, they were just different, right? And so the assumptions I made about how some other piece of code would have handled something are wrong, and then I had to debug that, right? And so those silent assumptions that you make when you create a policy are important. It's important to understand that that gives you a bonus. And so if you can create an environment where you and any other programmers that you're working with can all agree on some basic ground rules of how you're going to do things, doesn't matter what those ground rules are, if they're any good, just even having some does allow people to be more efficient, right? <clears throat> uh, SE5A1 says, I keep running into problems that I cannot figure out, but if I drop it and come back to it at a later date, I can sometimes figure out what's going wrong within 10 minutes. Any suggestions on how to improve my problem solving in this regard? Um, <clears throat> I think I would probably have to see the kinds of problems that you're working on and what you're missing, right? Um, I'll start with the obvious statement, which is that for a sufficiently hard problem, what you described is just what happens. So it doesn't matter how good of a programmer you are or how much you've experienced you have. If you're fighting a very hard problem, sometimes going away for a while and coming back to it is the only way that your brain can really grapple with it. Because either you've become too enmeshed in a set of assumptions that need time to fade, or there's too much newness there and your brain hasn't had the background time necessary to really chew through it and condense it down into operable like neuron pathways. And when you give it that time and then come back to it, they light back up in a much more simplified way than when it was all new, and now you can make forward progress, right? And so one thing to remember is it's not necessarily a sign you're doing something wrong if you're fighting that. You may just be at the limits of human intelligence at that point, and that's just the way it goes. I don't think there are programmers who are so awesome that they never have what you're describing happen, right? Certainly, I have this. I no good programmers out there who have this happen. I don't know of good programmers that are so awesome that they don't have that happen. I, I just, uh, maybe there are some, but I don't know who they are, who they would be. Um, as for if these problems are actually relatively simple um, to an experienced programmer who would have just come in and gotten the 10 minute answer just fine and don't really need to sleep on it or spend weeks or months uh, ruminating um, again, I think that just comes from a certain level of experience and having worked through enough problems that you start to have sort of generic problem solving structures in your head that generally work for the simpler problems, right? And you just haven't built up enough of those yet, but you will. If you keep working at it, right, your brain will continue to learn shortcuts to problem solving that allow it to attack problems more quickly. And eventually there'll be less and less of those problems that take you um, a significant amount of, of dead time to approach. I don't necessarily have a lot of uh, ways of saying, well, you know, here's how you get better at that more quickly. But what I would say is just keep doing it is probably, um, the only real requirement, right? Keep forcing yourself to solve problems that you find difficult and they should start to get easier over time as your brain builds up that uh, extra circuitry. If you just don't, if you just say ask too hard and stop, 
uh, that's probably the only real way that you will s not, you know, improve over time uh, and get and get quicker would be my guess. What font do you recommend for a native desktop app? A font that looks pleasant to the eyes of a hard time finding one. Uh, thanks for your help. Um, I don't know, uh, Roboto is pretty good from the Google, you can get that from the Google free font set. Uh, it might be an Apache or an open font, I don't know what it is. Roboto is pretty good. Um, Droid Sans I think was pretty good. Um, Yeah, I don't. I don't really remember which ones. I'm sorry, I don't know. But uh, I agree, it's hard to find. What's the hardest programming problem you found yourself dealing with? Um, I don't. I don't really know how to answer that question. Sorry. Do you ever use Volgrind? Uh, would you recommend it for C code? Is there a decent Windows alternative? Um, I, I haven't myself used it. I do think those types of utilities tend to be good. Um, Guess I would say, does LLVM's address sanitizer work on Windows? Probably, I think it does. That might be something to look at. I'm not sure if it does or not, though. Um, one of the things you can do is like what we did in Handmade Hero, where you can force allocations to go through a thing that lines them up at the ends of buffers. That's something you can do uh, with just your own code, right? And we did that in Handmade Hero, and that's one way to find those buffer overruns that I think works pretty well. And it's pretty easy to implement. Um, just make your own, always call your own memory allocator and then thunk it through to whatever you were using uh, in normal code. But when you want to run in protected code, uh, you can make it so that it randomly picks under or overflow uh, protection um, and aligns it with a buffer with, a mem with an unmapped page right next to it so that it'll fault. And we did that on Handmade Hero. So that's, you can go look at how we did that. Uh, that's one way to provide some some extra protection there. Uh, if you're on a platform that, that you don't have an automated utility to do it for you, it's not that hard to make your own for that. Uh, what language environment do you recommend for introducing young kids to programming? Um, I don't really know, you know, like maybe like something like JavaScript or something would be a good start. And the reason I say that is, is yeah, it's, it's kind of a crap language, but you know, so is basic. And that's what a lot of us from the old days learned on, you know, basic's a crap language, but you're just trying to get your feet wet. So, you know, the reason I'd say JavaScript is it has a lot of the same, um, uh, it has a lot of the same aspects of basic from the old days, which is that you, it's on everything. So, you know, you just, if you, your kid knows how to use a web browser, you can just teach them how to hit F12 and start looking at the code, right? Which is exactly the way like old basic used to be like on an Apple II, right? You used to be able to just like hit a key and it would just dump you into a basic shell, right? Um, and the other thing is you can just tweak the existing stuff and see the results on the web page, right? Um, and so I feel like that barrier to entry being basically zero uh, is probably the right place to start. It doesn't have data types, so they don't have to understand what that means. Um, they can just like do simple stuff like put in the file name of a picture, right? Um, so I would say JavaScript is a good thing to start with. Uh, and, you know, don't try to start kids off with a good quote unquote language because you're not trying to teach them like good programming habits or something like that. You're just trying to get them to understand like what code even is, right? And then once they can sort of get the hang of like the JavaScript stuff, um, 
then I'd say try to move them over into something a little bit more real, right? Where, where they could start thinking about types and, and something that has like memory, like C would be good. Um, but I, I wouldn't start them there because it's just, it's too much, right? It's, it, they won't have enough mental traction. Um, and I think they just get discouraged. You know, if you try to teach them C right off the bat, I think they just get too discouraged. Um, uh, that, that's just that's just my my thinking. I don't know. I don't, a lot, I don't teach kids how to program, so I don't really know. Um, you should probably ask someone who's tried. Uh, you know, there's people who try who work on like early. You know, how do we teach you know ten year olds to code or something, and uh, and see like what they've found is the most useful. Uh, ways of getting kids to start and stick with it and I'm, I'm not sure um, but like most people I know from my generation probably started with basic at least a little bit right and it's not like you did it for long you know so I'm not saying program JavaScript for like seven years right but just a couple months of you get learning how to program at all or what programming even is I think you want something really basic um, and really really like uh, trivial to just see what happens when you tweak things. Um, do you think learning to program with C is a bad idea? Y yeah, I kind of do. Um, I think C is maybe a good second language to learn because you, you should learn memory management uh, and you should be able to look at like direct ASM output from what you do as like the next thing you learn but but as a first language it's just it's too much um i mean you could do it but i just i don't think it makes a lot of sense you know what i'm saying how often do you work on random small products that aren't work related uh i don't really sometimes i do uh, like meow hash, I tried to break off as a separate thing. Um, but again, that's I needed that. Like I, I needed the hash for what I was doing. So yeah, I wasn't like just sitting around going, oh, I'm gonna make a hash function just because I can and I don't actually need it for anything. So most of the time, I have a reason. Like I make the thing because I needed it. You know. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and close it down. Okay, thank you everyone for joining me for those sort of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along with the series, you can always pre-order the game from handmadehero.org and it comes with a source code uh, so you can follow along online. Uh, you can also always click on the Handmade Hero Head if you want to get the rest of the My Rocket sites. Uh, if you want to find out what I'm working on these days, uh, it's all up here. Check it out. Um, I will be back next week when we will get the font stuff. Probably, hopefully, uh, yeah, you know, optimistically speaking, I think next weekend we could finish that up. Uh, at which point I think that means we are uh, sort of code complete on being able to just rebuild all of our assets from a directory full of stuff that anyone can now edit um, who wants to. So you can basically build a completely own version um, of all of our art assets, replace them with your own, do whatever you want, add as many new ones as you want. Uh, and so that's a good place to be. I'm pretty happy with that. And uh, we've, so, so we're rapidly closing on that. There'll be a nice milestone. Uh, so maybe we'll hit that next weekend. Hopefully we will. Um, hope to see you back here for that. Until then, have fun programming, everyone, and I'll see you all on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.